I was driving in Leamington this week. I was driving up Erie Street, and in front of me was a Purolator truck. And along the sidewalk was this, uh, this guy in one of those battery-powered motor scooters. He was kind of a big guy, and he had his scooter, and he was driving along Erie Street. We came to that corner where the lights are, and there's the Burger King, you know what I'm talking about? You turn in there, and you can go to the plaza with Walmart, and, and we're coming in there, and, and the Pure Later guy decides, I'm going to make a right-hand turn, but he had to wait because the motor scooter guy was going straight along the sidewalk and he was crossing and, and, and he had the right of way. And I, I think the motor scooter guy got kind of nervous that this guy in this pure later truck was going to make a right, wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to turn and, and run him over. So he was watching the, the, the truck and not watching where he was going. And instead of, instead of going over to the place where, you know, they bring the curbs down for people that are in scooters and wheelchairs and things like that, he misjudged that. And instead, he went over the curb, and this thing went kind of like this, as the front wheels went over, and then the back wheels went over, and on those scooters, have you ever seen one of those scooters? And I don't know what they're there for, but they've got like these two bars that stick out the back, and there's two little wee wheels on those bars. It's like what you'd see on a dragster, so they don't and go over. I'm sure that that's not the purpose for them on the, world, on the little scooters. But... So he goes over there with his back wheels, but those two little things sticking out of his back wheels get stuck on the curb. And so he's stuck out there, and his wheels are spinning, but they're not connecting with the pavement. And he's stuck on the curb, and I'm like, <laughs> wow, he's stuck. I better do something about it. But before I could do anything, pure later guy, jumps out of the right side of his truck, kind of like Batman, but without the cape and cowl. <laughs> and he tells the guy, he says, turn your wheels this way. And he grabs the one end and he lifts and he kind of rocks it. And he rocks Buddy off the curb and he does that. And away he goes and he, pure later guy jumps in his truck and he makes his right hand turn. And I, I watched all that. It just happened in seconds. I couldn't even get my car in park and my seatbelt off to help. And... All I could think of was, hey, that's what I'm talking about on Sunday. That's kind of like the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He's there. He, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't drive the scooter for us. But when we get ourselves stuck, folks, when we get ourselves off of the path, when we get ourselves in a place where we're just spinning our wheels... We have, and this is how Jesus describes him, somebody who comes alongside us as a helper. That's exactly how Jesus describes the Holy Spirit. And he gets us going in the right direction. But we have to be the ones who get going. And it's not the Holy Spirit's fault if things aren't happening in our lives. We're stuck up on a curb somewhere spinning our wheels. Or we're not going. And so the Holy Spirit is with you. And, and the Holy Spirit is alongside you. You know, there's an a old fellow, he'd come to church every week and he'd pray and he begged God to fill him. He said, oh Lord, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me with the Spirit. Now the pastor knew his life. So the pastor would be praying on the other side of the church, Lord, don't fill him, he leaks, he leaks, he leaks. <laughs> How many know what it's like to leak? Oh, yeah, come on, the rest of you, you all know that. We all leak. We all experience the Holy Spirit's infilling. Whether you call yourself a Pentecostal or a Catholic or a this or a that, folks, you're not a Christian if you don't have the Holy Spirit filling your life. Amen? You're not. Because the Holy Spirit is for everyone. Let's see what uh, the word of God has to say. And we'll get into this right now. Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 18. A little bit of a long scripture, but I want to read it all. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. This is the birth of the church. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They seemed to be what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. 
And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans, then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phylicia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretes and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them, saying they've had too much wine. Then Peter sp- stood up. This is, this is important. This is where it gets good. He stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. The bars haven't opened yet. I threw that in. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Next week, we're going to get a little bit more into this prophecy of Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Father, I pray that as we look at the infilling of your Holy Spirit, that you would open our eyes, open our understandings, and open our hearts, Lord, to what your word has to teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been fortunate in my ministry to experience what I would consider sovereign outpouring of God's Spirit in my life, in my ministry I've just experienced, I've just watched it. Actually, it's, it's, it's more like so been in, in the churches and the people in the churches that have experienced it. And I've just been privileged to keep my name off it and keep, my, keep, keep, away, keep from stopping it and get in the flow of it. And to be honest, once you've experienced that in your life, it's really hard not to. It, it, there's this great hunger and a look for it to happen. And it's never the same in one place. It's always different because the needs and the people and the situations are always different. On the day of Pentecost, God poured out the Holy Spirit. There were visible signs of tongues of fire that rested on each person. These people spoke in tongues, which was a language that they had not learned or understood. And what the people were speaking was prayer and worship to God. People thought that they were all drunk. Peter stepped up and addressed the crowd. The apostles recognized that this event was a fulfillment of Jesus' promise and of what God promised in the Old Testament by sending and making a new covenant with us and that Jesus promised he would do after the cross and the resurrection that he would send his Holy Spirit. One of the four corners of your faith, of the Christian faith and the Christian message, is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's not an option. It's a command. It's a requirement. We are to be people of the fire, people of the flame, people who are filled with God's Spirit, passionately living for the Lord, living in the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and being led by the Spirit of God. So God calls you and I today to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's that's just as plain as the New Testament teaches, and that is one of the main corners of the gospel. So let's talk about what God is really doing and what really happened there on the day of Pentecost. First of all, God found a new place. He found a new place. Now, if you ever talk to a real estate person, they'll tell you it's location, location, location. Location is so important in in, uh, real estate that they often will repeat it three times. And that means that the best house in the wrong location is not worth as much as a similar house 
or even a smaller house in the right location. There's a big difference between owning a home in Vancouver and one in Kingsville. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit changed location and effectively began to carry out the ministry of Jesus through his church. When did Jesus' ministry end? The proper question, the, the right answer to that question is never. It hasn't ended. Jesus' ministry carries on through you and through me by the Holy Spirit. See, God began, and, and we, we could go back in the Old Testament to the very, very beginning books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, and we would find that God, uh, his presence among his people, he chose to dwell in a tabernacle. Now, tabernacle is a tent, is a tent. Exodus chapter 40, verse 35, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud that settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and the fire was in the cloud by night. So we see those same things that we see in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 2. We see the fire there. We see the cloud. We see the glory of the Lord in this tent. Now, does God dwell in a tent today? No. So you don't see anybody pitching a tent saying, here's where the presence of God dwells. Do we see that today? No, because people know God doesn't dwell in a tent. He just doesn't. And so we move on in history and David is like, well, you know what, God, you're, you're living in this old tent and we dragged that through the desert a thousand years ago and it's not looking too good. And it's kind of embarrassing when people come and visit from these other nations and they got these great temples and they say, hey, where does your God dwell? And we go, he's in the tent. <laughs> you need a temple. And David said, uh, God says to David, God says, I don't need a temple. Because I created all of heaven and earth, and that's my temple. And the earth is where I, I chose to put my feet. In other words, I stand on the earth. But the whole heavens is my temple. Anyway, God, God says, but I, I'll let your son build a temple. And so Solomon built a temple. And this is the second time we see this fire and glory of God at the inauguration of the of the first temple, 2 Chronicles 7, 1 to 2. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice. The glory of the Lord filled the temple and the priest could not enter the temple because the glory of the Lord filled it. Now, folks, you know what? We, we're, we're in this thing where people think, well, if I take some bricks and I put some mortar between them and I stack them up on top of each other, I can make these four walls and I can call it a temple. And God will dwell there, right? Wrong. God, we serve a God who does not dwell in temples. Everybody say, amen. amen. He doesn't dwell in buildings. Well, I fought that through my ministry. That is the sanctuary, the holy place of God. No, it's not. It's a building. Because God doesn't dwell in buildings. Pentecost marks a change of location. It's all about location, folks. Location, location, location. And regarding God's relationship with you and I, he moved into a new temple, the physical manifestation of his glory. The manifestation, it appeared in Acts chapter 2 as he moved into a whole new dwelling place. The tongues of fire resting on each person was a sign of God inaugurating a new place where he would dwell. Not with temples made of bricks and mortar and wood and stone, but rather in the lives of the men and women who would follow him where Paul says, now you are the temple of God. Amen. Say it, I am the temple of God. 
See, some of you don't believe that. You've been taught it. You got it here, but you don't have it here. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, the fire doesn't need to repeat. It didn't need to repeat. It was a one-time event showing just as a sign that God's moved in and his glory has moved in. But on the day of Pentecost, that happened to human beings, men and women, and women. Everybody say amen. amen. All the women, amen. amen. There was a blowing, a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were seating. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each one of them. So God lives in you and in me. Not in buildings, not in houses, not in whatever you want to call it. Four walls or a tent or that. He lives in you. And so Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18, Do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Oh, let's, let's agree with that. Let's get filled with the word of God, with the spirit of God. The word be filled is in the present tense in Greek. You're always to be filled with the spirit. It's in the imperative mood. That means it's not an option. It's absolutely imperative that you continually be filled with the spirit because wherever you go, God goes. Because you are his place. You are his location. You are his temple. So there's a new place, a new place, and you're it. But then there's a new type of person too. Are you a person of the flame, of the power and the presence of the spirit? And if you are, you are not filled with the likeness of the world, but rather filled with the presence and the glory of God. You're a new person. You were before you became a Christian, you were the old person, the old life. But when you became a Christian, who filled your life? God did, the Holy Spirit. And you became a new person. 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we who with unveiled trace, uh, faces all reflect the Lord's glory. Why is that? Because it's in us. Because it's upon us. We are being transformed into his likeness. With ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So where there is no transformation, there is no Holy Spirit. Oh, where there is no transformation, there's no Holy Spirit. You know, we're, we're creatures of habit and we're creatures of systems. We like to make systems... And then we like to make habits that those systems support. And most of those are good. Most of those are good. But, but here's what happens. When the Holy Spirit comes in, he breaks up our systems and he does new things. And it's the same in the church. The, the greatest thing I ever did in the church was just get out of the way of what God was doing. Because he's got a better agenda than I do. Amen. And I, I, I just, just, I just, I, I guess if I learned one thing, it was get, get out of the way. That, that's, that's the only thing I kind of maybe have learned theologically that really works great. Just get out of the way and let God be God. There's no transformation where there is no spirit. People who have the infilling of the Holy Spirit, they're people who are always changing. They're always changing into the greater image and a greater representation and a greater glory of Jesus Christ. And this image refers to God's moral character. One of the greatest outpourings in our times. And when I'm talking our times, I'm talking maybe my time. Back in 1971. How many can say that's our times? Okay. How many would say, no, nah, no, nah, that's your time. <laughs> oh, dear. You know you're getting older when there's more people that put up their hand and say, yeah, that's your time. Okay, my time <laughs> was in, of all places, Saskatoon. Yeah, Saskatoon. Yeah, an outpouring and uh, a revival. They called it the Confessor's Revival. I mean, this just shows you the 
the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and this is reported by church historian Almer Towns. He calls this one of the greatest revivals in his time and my time. The Confessor's Revival. And, and what happened there was unbelievable. That just went on for months and months. Couples tore up their divorce papers before thousands of people. The chief of police says there's a rash of confessing of crimes. Shopkeepers say they were staggered by the number of folks owning up to shoplifting. When lawyers, psychologists, and Jesuit priests got saved, when deacons and many church members confessed with tears and with great shame and brokenness that they had been living in adultery, fornication, thieving, and lying. When all of this and, all, and loads more happened night after night and week after week, one might say that there is a touch of the Holy Spirit on that place. And that's what happened in Canada out west, the Confessor's Revival, where thousands of people got touched by the Holy Spirit and then just began to confess openly. Man, I tell you, that's got to be the Holy Spirit, eh? This is when do we do confess openly to all the stupid things we've done. But confess openly and then make amends to turn it around. What's happening there is the Holy Spirit got inside. The Holy Spirit began to stir and people just began to get hungry and thirsty for God. So there's a, there's a new place. We become new people, but then we live by new power. There's power in you. Paul, Paul prayed, Lord, I want to know the power of your resurrection. How many would pray that prayer today? I want to know the power of your resurrection, Jesus. Acts Chapter 1, verse 8, Peter says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Samaria, all the way to the ends of the earth. I have experienced this power and outpouring of the Spirit. And when you've experienced it, you don't want to settle for the routine or the mediocre. You want the Spirit to move in you. Lord, blow in us fresh, fresh power. Now let's go back to our... Let's go back to our purulator guy for a minute. Not that he's the Holy Spirit or anything like that. But it's kind of relevant in a sense. It, it, it's, it, you know, this fellow, he's stuck on the curb like many Christians. We're stuck somewhere just spinning our wheels. And, and, and yet, you know, the Holy Spirit is there. But it isn't until, it isn't until purulator guy jumps out of his van and gives that helping hand that that fellow experienced his power to get off of that and get back going again. It's the same way, you're, you hear people, I've heard people say, oh, you shouldn't be praying for the Holy Spirit. You can't have more of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit already lives inside you. Well, is that true? Does the Holy Spirit already live inside you? So why does the Bible keep telling us, be filled, be filled, be filled? It's because that not only does the Holy Spirit live inside us, but when we are asking God to fill us and empower us. We're asking for an unction. We're asking for him to jump out of the van and in, grab a hold and give us a good push. Does that make sense? That's what it's called, talk about. And it's with that manifestation of his power that he is able to do the absolutely incredible through your life. Now, what do you have to do? There's no gimmick to experiencing the Holy Spirit's power. In those times when the Holy Spirit is present and when he is pouring out his power, stuff happens, folks. It just happens. But here's what it accompanies. Here's what happens before it happens. There's prayer. There's prayer. Folks, yeah, I, I asked God to give us a big footprint and, and, and God said, you know, don't, don't allow the shoe to be determined the size of the foot. And, you know, we've got, a, we've got a great footprint. God's using us in, in places we never thought he would. And, and we're doing things that, that, that we never thought we could because of God. But folks, we back that up and we have to back that up with prayer. You want to see God work in your family? You have to back that up with, say it, prayer. 
You want God to walk with and be with your children throughout school and watch over their lives and their minds and their hearts? That's going to happen if you back it up with prayer. So we want to keep prayer. Prayer is important. We have a prayer service at 10 o'clock. When we go back to two services two weeks from now, we're going to keep that time and that prayer service. If you want prayer, there's a place to come and to receive prayer and just to pray and to call on God for your church and for revival. So there's prayer. There's a hunger, a hunger where we're not satisfied anymore with the status quo. We want more. We want more. We want more of God. Where there's a humility and repentance Where we're not working hard to look good, but rather we're putting our passion into connecting with Jesus. And the result, folks, is an explosion of the Holy Spirit power and a multiplication of what God is able to do in your lives. Let's stand together. I just want you to close your eyes and close yourself in. And maybe when when you see that picture of that guy stuck on the curb and the wheels spinning and he's not going anywhere, you say, Lord, in my Christian life, I've been spinning. I thought, well, maybe maybe this will help or maybe that will help or maybe I should do this or go there. Or go. But, but that's not going to be the answer. The answer is the Holy Spirit. To begin to pray and get hungry and thirsty for God. And say, God, I need your infilling more and more than I ever have. I need the outpouring and the unction of your power more than I ever had. Lord, my, boy, my, my children need it. My boy and my girl need it. They need to see mommy and daddy on fire for God. Sold out for you and living in passion and an awareness that the Holy Spirit is in charge. Some of you have been spinning your wheels all the time. And it's like, why am I I not getting anywhere? Well, under your own steam, you'll get stuck. And when you do, you need the Holy Spirit to come alongside you and empower you. So I I want you to take that one area of your life where you just need the Holy Spirit to intervene. And I want you to confess to him, Lord, I'm getting out of the way. And I'm giving this to you. Pour out your Holy Spirit in me. Lord, work through me. Maybe if you're stuck, say, Lord, I confess to you, I am stuck. I am stuck. I'm just stuck. And I need you to come alongside me and get me back on the right track. Through their Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray you just pour your spirit out in our homes, in our families. That this week we would see the invisible presence and the manifestation of your power and your might and your leading and your guiding. And we'd hear the still small voice in front of us, inside us. That we'd feel that nudge. Lord, some of us have been so dry And so stuck for so long, we think this is normal, Lord. Get us unstuck from that, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I I just want to, just as I close, I want to just give you the last illustration I have is a true story from a guy. You may have heard of him. He's an old guy. He's not even from my time. He's so old. His name was John Wesley. And he was praying for the church and he saw England in such a mess and Europe was being absolutely bloodied by revolution. And he stood on that island of England and he saw it coming against England. That nation embroiling itself and sinking itself in all of the turmoil and bloodshed that was taking place in other nations in, in, in Europe at the time. And Wesley drew around himself a circle and he said, God, we need you. We need the Holy Spirit. Come and start with me. And many people say it was the Methodist revival from John and Charles Wesley that saved England. That saved England. Folks, Canada needs men and women that will not focus on all of the crap and junk that's out there. But if we focus on a God who is here, And he's here and say, Lord, it's 
start it with me. Amen. Amen. Lord, do something in us, I pray. Shake us, touch us, and fill us again with your glory and power through our church, in each one of our people. And may we rejoice and experience again the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.